Good evening, everyone. Kelly and I got our vocal cords all warmed up for you. We're ready for tonight's webinar. Um, my name is Lindsay Glasner. I am the Outreach Coordinator with the Birds Sleuth K-12 program. I am joined by Kelly Schaefer, our Education Speci Specialist, and we're happy you guys are joining us tonight for our webinar around independent student investigations, data analysis, and interpretation. Oh, and my seat just sunk. Okay. <laughs> And then we are back up. There we go. So uh, for tonight's webinar, for those of you who are new, I know there are some familiar names. There are some new names to me. Uh, we are using the Zoom platform. We try to make our webinars interactive as possible. For this week, we are actually going to do some polling, which will be fun. But in making it as, as interactive as possible, we would like you guys to use the chat window. So if you can, the chat button somewhere on your screen, we've learned that it can be in all different corners based on your computer. Um, but ideally, once you've opened the chat window, just exit full screen, that will allow you to dock your chat window on the side. Once you've done that, if you could please select send to all participants or everyone or all panelists and all participants, something that indicates that you're sharing with other users or, or viewers of this webinar, that will be greatly appreciated. We uh, want you guys to really share your ideas with each other and allow that uh, interaction. So let us test the chat window. If you can, again, open that up. Let us know where you're from, what your role is as an educator, if you're doing student investigations, how you might find this webinar helpful. Just test out that chat window and let us know what's going on this evening. Ellen is soon to retire. Don't congratulations, much, Ellen. Ellen. Oh, you're saying don't leave. I'm saying congratulations. Um, so several informal science educators. STEM. Ooh. Oh, this is, oh, mom. Sorry, we're, we're just trying to read names here. Oh, okay. Let me open up my chat window. Well, <laughs> we're doing a dual computer screen right now. So, Molly working with STEM educators across the state, Marine, environmental educator, uh, informal educator. Wow, a lot of informal educators right now. Hong Kong, we are international tonight. Excellent. Welcome. Um, you organized citizen science projects before. Great. So it seems like we have a lot of informal educators tonight. Uh, we'll try and direct some of the resources a little more relevantly. A PhD student. Excellent. Okay. Wonderful. So thank you guys for taking the time to introduce yourselves. And we, uh, just to give you guys a brief background, Kelly and myself work for the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. We're based in Ithaca, New York. It does not look like this right now as we have some snow that's melting into ugly mud. However, it's a gorgeous building and I'm very grateful for working here. At the lab, we are mission driven. It's a, a nonprofit membership institution where our mission is to interpret and conserve the Earth's biological diversity through research, education, and citizen science, all focused on birds. Um, specifically, Kelly and myself work with the K through 12 program here at the lab. So we take all the knowledge and information that happens here and develop resources that build science skills while inspiring young people to connect to local habitats, explore biodiversity, and engage in citizen science projects. Again, my name is Lindsay Glassner. I'm the Outreach Coordinator. Kelly Schaefer, our Education Specialist, is gonna be managing the chat window tonight. She'll be sharing helpful links, resources, answering any questions you may have. Please keep her engaged so she doesn't fall asleep on me. Um, 
And just so you all are aware, we are recording this webinar. We have the same exact webinar happening on Thursday night. That webinar will also be recorded. Based on how each of those go, we'll choose one of them to post the recording on our YouTube channel on Friday. We'll send you an email on Friday with a link to some of these resources, as well as that archived recording, just so you are aware. So in this webinar, we're gonna go through a few things. We're gonna first talk about um, the whole concept is around inquiry and student experiments. We're going to play with some citizen science themes around that too. So we'll talk about what makes a fair experiment for your student investigations, um, discover some common mistakes that kids make with data analysis and interpretation, uh, how they can make graphs and charts using citizen science data from eBird, and then we'll explore some opportunities for the kids to share their projects through our national challenge that we have launched this spring. So, real quick, a big theme and resource that we'll be talking about, um, the big, the, basically all the content that we will be talking about is around this curriculum investigating evidence on the left. This is a free download on our website. It's designed for K through 12, and it's a guide for you as an educator to take kids through the process of having kids design their own studies, their own experiments, their own investigations. Now, it, it's really comprehensive guide, but the wonderful and unique aspect about this is it really has a citizen science spin on it. So there is no specific bird theme. Many of the examples are bird related. We are the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. However, throughout each lesson, you'll be introduced to new citizen science projects, such as Journey North, Project Budburst, eMammal, many of these projects that range throughout um, global to local scales throughout different um, wildlife or even non-wildlife such as stars and galaxies, sound analysis. So it really plays off this idea that though birds are super cool, we really want you to have kids become inspired to do their own investigations around content that they are truly interested in. Um, that's what investigating evidence is really designed for. Now to complement investigating evidence, on the right is our Integrating Inquiry for Educators course. This uses investigating evidence as its textbook, so to say. Integrating Inquiry for Educators is an online course. It's your comprehensive PD around how to foster citizen science and um, in student investigations. We've had amazing feedback from both of these resources. We're hopefully going to release some evaluation data showing that these resources have really supported um, students' interest and uh, understanding of science and the connection to nature. That should hopefully be, the article should be published this spring, I believe. So more on that to come, but this really are, these are gonna be the two main resources we talk about throughout this webinar. So another quick little bit of introduction. We're gonna jump into this webinar already with the mindset of kids designing their own experiments and, and how they can go through the um, experimental design process as well as the data collection and analysis aspect. For those of you who are specifically interested in getting kids to make observations, to um, ask those questions and how to create those questions into experiments, I recommend looking into our first webinar around inquiry that was done this fall. It's called From Observations to Questions, an Introduction to Inquiry. I'll have Kelly share the link to that in the chat window where she already has, since she's dancing. Okay, she'll be sharing that to the chat window. It's on our YouTube channel, which all of our archive webinars are there. Um, but this is a really great webinar just to give you that foundation of how to inspire observations, how to get them to start asking the questions. So we're going to jump off into what is inquiry. Again, we're going to test that chat window. Make sure you guys are awake on me tonight, with me tonight. So if you can, in the chat window, let me know what you think of when you hear the word inquiry.
And while you're all typing, I'm seeing Kelly is already giving a nice list of links. We'll be sure those are all in the archive webinar for you guys. Okay, so looking at some of these thoughts, when we think about inquiry, think of asking questions, investigations, questions that we don't know the answer to. Yes. When for Sleuth, when we think of inquiry, we think of um, several things. The first and foremost, we want to think about so students coming up with their own ideas for questions. Yeah, absolutely. When we think of inquiry, um, my first thought was what I was taught back in school, which is the scientific method, that linear process of asking a question, doing your background research, constructing a hypothesis, testing that hypothesis, analyzing information, and then creating a report. It's a very um, mundane <laughs> and linear process, so to say. And I mean, if we want to go by the formal definition up here in the right, an act of asking for information or an official investigation. For Bird Sleuth, we really hit on three different points. And, and Carol, you touched on that first point for us. It's having kids asking and answering their own questions. It's that authenticity where, you know, sometimes, Kids are going to ask their own questions, and you as educators have the opportunity to say, keep calm, pretend this is part of the lesson plan. Um, it's okay if it's not exactly what you're going for, but if they are starting to ask questions or veer towards topics that they are genuinely interested in, you can then play off of that embrace that use that as an opportunity to keep them motivated and interested in the topics and then spin the lessons to still address the concepts while keeping the kids motivated and along with that that inquiry can really inspire project-based learning so where kids take on a whole project or a whole endeavor that they can again be inspired by because it's their own question but also think about how how it, it comes as a full package and going from that start to finish of asking the question to finding the answer and then sharing their results now for those of you in the, the united states it it's inherently going to meet the next generation science standards Though your state may not have adapted the specific identical next generation science standards, most states are um, adapting some form of these standards, whether it's being modified slightly. But this, these practices, these science practices, is a big theme within the NGSS standards. And these are asking questions and defining problems, developing and using models, planning and carrying out investigations, analyzing and interpreting data. There's eight of them total, but many of these are going to be met when students are doing their own investigations and or participating in citizen science. And so that's a big theme that um, we really want to support with inquiry and investigations. It's not a linear method. It's not just an official investigation. When we look at the science process, it really is a complex um, being in the fact that there is no specific route a, a child can take when doing investigation. And so you as educators have to then understand how can we foster the sense of, of science and investigations in the kids and keep them motivated. And that's what we're here to help you with. So when we think about investigations, there are many different ways that kids can start at. Naturally, kids will start asking questions. And many of those questions will simply go down to this drawn back of reference materials. They ask a question and they can look up the answer to it. However, we want to start getting them more towards the exploring and analyzing data or conducting their own studies, whether those be observational or experimental. Again, we talk about much of that in the first webinar, that archive webinar that's already on our YouTube channel. So today we're going to jump right into, we're having kids who are conducting their own studies or analyzing the data and how do we do that effectively for the students and teach that effectively. So when we have a study or an experiment, science experiments use variables. We have constants and variables. And the difference is, um, this is specifically for an experiment. So we go back here, 
The observational study is solely going to be observing. We don't have any variables that we are controlling. Whereas the experimental study, we are going to have these independent and dependent variables. So our independent variable, it's the one factor that's changed by the person doing the experiment. So it's whatever me as the um, scientist is changing. Whereas the dependent variable is dependent on the independent variable. It's a factor that is measured in the experiment. And then one of the big things we want to have kids recognize are constants or controls. These are factors that we want them to stay the same in an experiment. So we ask, we have these independent and dependent variables as well as controls. In the chat window, I wanna challenge you guys to answer this question. Why is it important to change only one independent variable? Why is it important just to have one changing factor in an experiment? Kelly, absolutely, yes. So it's important just to have one manipulated variable. I like how you put that. So we can focus just on the effect of that manipulated variable. If we change multiple things, we're not sure um, if there was any form of relationship. Whether that relationship, most often kids will think about it, is cause and effect. And Maureen, you're absolutely right. This is, it helps avoid confusion especially if working with younger kids, having too many variables um, makes it quite difficult. So when looking at this, we're going to have an, an experimental design and we want to make sure that this experiment is fair. That means that everything except the ind independent variable is held constant. So only the independent variable is, is changing, and that means our experiment is fair. So let's have an example. Will birds prefer a blue, red, or yellow feeder? This was an experiment done by the fledgling ornithologists uh, a few years back, and they wanted to test, will birds prefer red, blue, or yellow feeders? Now, we want to then identify what are the constants, the independent variable and dependent variable for this. So our constants, the location of the feeders, the type of seed, um, the type of feeder, there's several different things we can think about keeping constant. Time the data is collected. Maybe there's some kind of weather we can consider with constants. Our independent variable based on this question is going to be what we, the scientists, are changing. And what we're changing is the color of the feeder, blue, red, or yellow. The dependent variable is what we are measuring based off of that change. So for us, this is going to be amount of seed. However, we could do something as um, maybe it's bird visits. Uh, there's several different ways we can measure the preference of feeder color. For us, um, in this experiment itself, I like measuring the amount of seed. One, especially for younger kids, that helps them practice skills such as measurements, but also there's less pressure for youth to um, either watch the feeders constantly or identify the birds that are visiting the feeder. We could easily change this question of do chickadees prefer blue, red, or yellow feeders? And then that puts a pressure on us having to identify a chickadee species or which species prefers which feeder color. Again, then we're focusing on species identification. Whereas a general question like this, leaving the dependent variable to just be measuring the amount of seed um, is a nice, easy uh, measurement for the independent variable. Once the data has been collected, so again, we started off the first thing after the kids have decided what their question is, what their experiment looks like, they need to make sure their experiment is fair, then they can collect the data. So the fair experiment having um, only the independent variable being manipulated by the scientists. Then we're collecting the data and it's now time for kids to actually start uh, creating visual representations of their data, which most times are graphs. 
given that we, we publish student work uh, on an annual basis through Births of the Investigator, we've come across quite a few graphical representations. And there are some times where bad graphs go wrong. Now, apparently, students are not the only ones who make this mistake. We've gathered some graphs thanks to an article from BuzzFeed about bad graphs gone wrong. So here's a Cooper's hawk population soars. And a deadly combination of shootings and a pesticide, DDDT, caused the Cooper's hawk in Illinois to stay at low levels throughout 20th century. However, over the past few years, the raptor has made a strong comeback. Now the graph visually does look like a strong comeback. However, from a, a novice or somebody who may not have any form of background information, I'm looking at my y-axis here and I'm seeing very, very small numbers. I don't know what those numbers are representing. And realistically, I don't know uh, what we are actually looking at. And so, though, yes, it looks like great. The, the graph is showing an increase. I don't know an increase of what. And so this is where we can think about bad graphs gone wrong. Here's another one from that BuzzFeed article. What grade are you in? 26% freshman, 26% senior, 26% sophomore, 26% junior. And it's great how all 26% look different in a pie chart and how 26% does not add up to 100. And this is a, a really fun, fun game to play of just searching bad graphs gone wrong. This graph that measures units of innovation not sure what this one is. Again, mislabeling axes. I don't, I don't know what innovation means, let alone um, a plug versus a phone and what those are representing. Uh, again, question of the day: What should cost less, a gallon of milk or, or sorry, a gallon of gas or a gallon of milk? Yes, no. <laughs> uh, should Scotland be independent? Fifty-two percent no. Fifty-eight percent yes. Wow, we have a percentage of 110 people in our population. Um, so again, these are just really fun articles. They're from the BuzzFeed. 13 graphs that clearly um, are lying. However, it's really, I enjoy starting off with this with kids, recognizing that, you know, even adults make mistakes sometimes, but it's important for for them who want to com effectively communicate their results, they need to make sure that their graph is worth a thousand words. So we've seen some great examples of bad graphs. What makes a good graph then? Again, let's go to the chat window, get some ideas of what makes a good graph. Yes, clear labels. I mentioned that a couple times, just having a y-axis um, being completely unknown. Properly labeling a graph is, is very important. Legible text, distinguishable colors, nothing that's orange or red. Titles, type of graph matches the data. Yeah, titles are really helpful. Absolutely. So. The graph tells the story you're trying to convey. Appropriate spacing on axes. Absolutely. So many of these lists are really trying to help the reader be able to look at a visually look at the graph and know what the, the graph is trying to convey outside of the context of the paper. And so, I mean, we bring back this phrase, is the picture worth a thousand words? Is your graph worth a thousand words? And there are several different graphs that are along the traditional sense that many kids will be using to support the data that they've collected. We look at these types of graphs, you can think of um, a pie chart, a bar graph, a line graph, a scatter plot. A pie chart, you need to have a, a, a proportion. You're sharing up to 100%. Not 110%, though Scotland really tried on that last graph. 
Um, you want to do 100%, and that's where the proportions are coming into play. Whereas uh, a bar graph is also going to be a comparison, like a pie chart, um, but you're comparing different categories. A line graph is going to be something that's showing change over time, which that time factor is really important compared to a scatter plot, which you're looking more for trends instead of something that is over a period of time. Yes, the graph should share a story, absolutely. Um, and so what we would like to do is we're going to have just a fun little poll. And I just launched the poll, which should pop up on your screen right now. You'll see in the top left corner, um, you'll see the graph number. The graph number relates to the question number. All the questions are the same. Is this graph worth a thousand words? Yes, no, or unsure. So what I'm going to ask you guys to do, I'm going to spend 15 to 20 seconds on each graph. You have a total of six graphs. You're going to assess whether that graph is worth a thousand words. Yes, no, or you're not sure. And again, that concept of worth a thousand words, can the graph stand alone? So we'll give you just a few more seconds on graph one, and then we'll continue on to number two. Did I miss something, Kelly? Oh yeah, you can drag the pole to the side so you can actually see the, the graph too. All right, moving on to graph two. Okay, we're gonna move on to graph three. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. All right, we're moving on to graph four. Kelly's laughing over here next to me. Graph five. Okay, and our final graph. And it's okay if you didn't answer for one of them or missed them. Um, we will go over step by step over all of them and talk about each graph as well. So when you are done with the poll, click all your answers in the poll and then we will launch it and share the results with you. And the poll in three, two, one, last off. Excellent, okay. So we're gonna share the results with you guys. Again, you can move those over to the side if you'd like. Kelly, I'm gonna look off of yours if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so let's go back to graph one. And is this graph worth a thousand words? Most people are saying no. Can we interpret the information um, from this graph? You know, if we thought really hard, we probably could. Uh, but from those of you who are saying no, what, uh, what, what specifically did you not like about this graph? Or if you had, I guess if this was your own um, kids work or your students work, what would you challenge them to think more about or think critically about this graph? Okay, very first question, what is being measured? You're not sure what the graph is trying to show. 
what is the story? Yeah. Basically asking the kid, what is the story? What are you trying to measure? I first see this and I think, okay, this is probably a middle school kid who is playing with Excel for the first time and discovered that you can make multiple colors um, mm -hmm. and wanting to use every single color in the rainbow. And that's where it is, again, very, very busy with all those different colors. It's hard to understand. The 3D aspect is not necessary. Um, there is, as people are asking, what is being measured? We don't know what's being measured because there are no labels. There are no axes. There is no title. Excellent. Let's move on to graph number two. Looks like many people agree that this graph is fairly clear, that it is worth a thousand words. So let's ask you guys just one thing. What is one thing you liked about this graph? <laughs> Great, those are some low standards. There's a title, <laughs> the exclamation point. Um, it's easy to read the data. It's labeled clearly. Yeah, it seems for you guys, labels are very um, clear for this, for very important for many of you. The data is easy to interpret. Now, what's interesting for this aspect of graph is we're looking at a line graph. If you recall, line graphs are something for us to interpret over a period of time. And they have depicted this line graph to me as well to show that over a period of time, the amount of seed eaten from these feeders are increasing. Now, that's slightly different from some of the graphs you may look on later, where it's to just focusing on cumulative seed. Um, so that's where we can also bring in conversations of comparing and contrasting the same data in two different graph forms. <clears throat> okay, what do we think about this graph, number three? It's looking like, you know, two people think that the graph is worth a thousand words. However, most people are thinking it's not. Um, let's go with the majority. Why is this graph not worth a thousand words? What is wrong with this graph? Yeah, more than 100%. Ellen asking the question, aren't owls raptors? I mean, it really depends on the definition, but the biggest factor is it does not add up to 100%. Um, I am very disappointed you guys did not like this graph since I made this myself, <laughs> but I guess I really need to go back to elementary school. Um, so no, this graph, the biggest issue right here is it does not add up to 100%. Okay, now again, we have another similar graph, very similar to our line graph. This is number four. And it's a uh, majority of people are saying that this graph is worth a thousand words. So let's identify with this one again. What is, or let's do compare and contrast. Do we like the bar graph versus the line graph? Just the comparison. There's no one right or wrong answer, but what are your thoughts? Well, Kelly, Kelly, go ahead. Um, I do you want to show the line graph? Oh, yeah, we can show the line graph again. So there's your line graph. I believe this is the same exact data. And here's your bar graph. Why don't we do a little compare and contrast? That was a very political answer, Kelly. It depends on the question you're trying to answer. Either could be used. That's a really good point. Molly agrees with that, yeah. So I guess that's a really good point, um, depending on your audience as well. So we go back to the line versus the bar graph. If the line specifically is looking at a change over time. We are seeing the amount of seed being eaten increase day by day over time. Compared to the bar graph, we are just looking at strictly the difference between blue, yellow, or red feeders. And 
So hearing from Maureen, it's easier to read for primary students to read a bar graph. So looking at the audience, Terry, I know that you work with elementary as well, thinking about, okay, who is your audience? If you're working with the younger groups, giving them the bar graph where it's simply adding up all the information and um, processing that into one simple bar graph. For those of you, especially in the um, upper elementary, middle, high school, giving them graphs that are depicting the same exact data and doing a compare and contrast between those graphs is also very valuable in learning how to um, analyze and interpret the data. So let's go on to our next graph. Does temperature affect the number of chickadees? Now this graph was number five, I want to say. Is this five, Kelly? Am I losing track? I think this is five. Yeah. Which it looks like, is this graph worth a thousand words? Two thirds of the people are saying, yes, yes it is. Well, Ellen's asking, at what age do kids really understand graphs or bar graphs? Good question, Ellen. It depends on the kid. I'm going to say that right off the bat. Um, I would definitely, and for those of you who are primary and elementary educators, feel free to chime in. I would suggest by a by grades two to three, they should really start being able to look at a bar graph, a simple bar graph like the one we had earlier, and understand and interpret what's happening. Oh good, Terry agrees with me, second grade. Excellent. Um, yeah, so that's where I'm thinking, right around second grade, for them to actually have a bar graph and be able to assess one is higher than the other, reading the axes properly and understanding what it's trying to convey. So what I would like to do here is we have this bar graph. Does temperature affect the number of chickadees? Now, I'm not sure if you recall, but this information, this data, is the same data from our very first multicolored extreme graph. Now, this, these, both these graphs were given to us by a very loving teacher who um, works with seventh through ninth grade students. And it's, whoa, right, Terry? Whoa. It's interesting to see the complete difference of same exact data but in two different uh, forms. And so looking again at that compare and contrast, especially for those of the older audiences, a graph makes a big difference. Now, I believe this is our final one. Is this graph worth a thousand words? Most people are saying no. Again, this is the same exact data that was in our bar chart in our very first graph. We talk about line graphs. Line graphs are over a period of time. But what is one of the biggest flaws of this graph that you guys are noticing? Um, share in the chat window. Yeah, what are the biggest things that the labels? We've talked about it several times. Anything else? People having this jump out at them? Time is not at regular intervals. I didn't even notice that. Let's see. Is time at a weekly interval? I think it's an attempt at a weekly interval. It's comparing birds and temperature. Yeah, so what, what's happening here are the number of birds and the, the temperature are both on the same exact axes. And it's not clearly labeled. And there's too much information happening here that is not conveyed clearly. So looking like a, a bar chart, here's one way to take all this data and information and analyze it in a sense. I'm not saying this is perfect because personally I don't like mean number of birds. Um, I think having 1.7 number of birds is silly, but uh, there's, there's a way for us to start looking at these, okay, figure out, do we actually have a clear question and was the data collected accurately as well? So that was just a little bit of fun with some data. Let's see if I can stop sharing results. So if you want to close out of the polling information, 
What I want to figure out is, or take you guys through right now, we've gone through, you know, how to create a fair experiment. We've played around a little bit with some um, how to create a proper graph. So looking specifically at what, what is your question? How is the best way to convey that answer? Sometimes I specifically ask the question of, okay, what am I trying to convey? What is the story I want to tell? And what's the best um, graph to support that? Is it a line graph? Am I trying to depict something over time? Or am I comparing two different results, um, such as population between a um, Carolina chickadee versus a black cat chickadee? And do I want to go with a bar chart instead with that sense? Am I looking for trends and trying to scatter plots? So first identifying what story you're trying to tell and choosing the correct graph. For teaching kids how to analyze and interpret the graphs, taking such um, specific graphs out of the context and giving them and having them write the story. Um, have them create that thousand word story or 20 word story or whatever based on that one graph. Can they figure out what that graph is trying to depict? Now, uh, going back to, if I went way back and we had the image of the girl who's saying, I wonder, and we broke her thoughts into, you know, reference material versus observational studies versus experimental studies. One of those was exploring and analyzing data. So what we're gonna try and explore, and make sure the screen share and it's correct, excellent. Um, I want you guys to introduce you to the eBird database. For some of you, you may already be very familiar with it. For others, this could be um, a new experience. eBird is the Cornell Lab's largest citizen science project. It's where people can submit any bird observation anywhere at any point in time. If you have used eBird before but haven't been on recently, surprise, they have a new homepage. They're currently going through some website updates, but all the content is still there and there's some really amazing features. One of the features I first wanna just barely briefly touch on is their eBird modeling. So what I did, let me see if I can uh, highlight my mouse here for you, spotlight. Okay, so what they've done is, get that down there. If you look under the science tab, I'm gonna go to eBird modeling here on the far right and clicking on that, they have been able to develop their own models specifically for different species. We were just talking with the eBird team this week. Currently there are four models. They hope by the end of this year, they'll have up to 100 models. So we'll just give you one example. Here's a barn swallow. And if I press play, let me just see if I can make this larger. There we go. We press play, you'll see that over a period of time, the dates are on the left here, just above the title barn swallow, and you'll see relative abundance are, are hovering y-axis, so to say, of the barn swallow. This is a really great model to use with kids. Again, one of the big focuses is analyzing and interpreting data. That's a science practice, part of the next generation science uh, standards. And looking at these eBird models that have been developed is a great opportunity for kids to, one, start to understand what is migration and to get a visual of migration. They can also start then creating their own stories of those birds or analyzing the different information. Why are indigo bunting, buntings far more popular in this Yucatan Peninsula area um, than, than further down in Central and South America? Or what kind of geographical reference are we seeing that's really highlighted here? We're referencing this to the Mississippi River where depending on different areas you're in, we can see Atlanta is kind of dulled out right in that Georgia area? Is it because it's an urban area or is it due to um, elevation or different habitat, whatnot? What type of information can we analyze and interpret from this? And this can be done at many, many different grade levels. So that's just one thing I wanted to briefly show you. Again, this is under the science tab in Ebert's page. 
under eBird modeling. The URL is eBird.org in case Kelly has not shared that in the chat window. So she'll just share that with you. The next thing I want to do is going under the Explore tab. So clicking on Explore, this is a whole series of information that we can explore photos, do regions, hot spots, species maps, et cetera. But they have a really nice feature where kids um, can ask their own questions about birds and instead of conducting their own experiment, um, either because they're restricted on time or maybe at um, the uh, location, they can then explore and query the eBird database. I'll give you one example. I'm gonna click on this bar chart here. And we had a young girl, I believe she was in seventh grade, who submitted a report to Birds with Investigator, our student publication magazine. And she asked the question, um, which state park has more bald eagles or do bald eagles perform something along those lines. And so she was able to um, specifically look at different regions in the United States and compare those with, um, compare the bald eagle sightings and create a full graph based on that information. So that's something that can be done within this bar chart area. So what I'm gonna do, let's just create our own little experiment. We are in New York right now. So I'm clicking New York and let's look at the entire region of New York. If you wanted to, you can do that or you can look at specific um, locations that you've visited yourself. So these are all the hotspots I've been to, but I'm gonna look at the entire region of New York. And what I wanna do, these are different bar charts. I can just start to analyze interpret information of, okay, here's a Canada goose, a very common species in the United States. And I can see that these bar charts are reflecting actual data, actual bird observations. Now it looks like Canada geese are, are found year round in New York. There are some times a year that they're less populated or less seen, but they're still found year round. Same with such birds like a moot swan. So looking at the difference, though a moot swan is found year round, they're less abundant than say a Canada goose. I can look at other, um, other bird species such as a common golden eye. There may be a couple areas where they're found year, year round, but mostly they're only found in New York during the winter time period. Again, our dates up here at the top. Let's scroll down to some fun birds. There's a lot of birds here. Okay, let's go to a barn swallow. We've already talked about barn swallows. So what I can do, I can see, you know, tree swallow, bank swallow, barn swallow, cliff swallow, lots of these different swallows here. And I can see, again, green is abundance. The sightings have been here that barn swallow is found through April through September and is common here in New York. But what I can also do is click on the actual name barn swallow. And this creates a full line graph for me. Now, what's fun about this is I can actually start adding some species. So I'm gonna go up top here and click change species. And I'm going to type in, give me some more species, Kelly. A purple martin. Nice, comes right up. Let's do an American robin, because that's a, a crowd pleaser. And let's do a bald eagle just because. Anything else I should do? Okay. So I can choose up to five species. Again, max species right here. I have four listed. Now I'm going to click continue. Now, based off of that, I've now created my bar chart up here. We can do that comparison. Again, here's our date. Or we can see a line graph down here and all the colors are labeled. We have our y-axis with percentage of frequency. We have our x-axis here, uh, the dates. And nice thing about this is this provides a full feature where on each day we can actually start to see all the data in that top right corner. So looking at this information in the chat window, what would you, uh, what story would you tell based off of this graph? Okay, Kelly's story is that birds are cool, but that's not quite the story I was going for. Based off of this line graph that we're looking at, what information can we get out of this? 
<laughs> okay, again, though this is awesome, <laughs> I'm happy for you, Maureen. <laughs> Not quite the story I was going for. <laughs> There are similar patterns over time. Maureen, it's okay. We appreciate your excitement. So one trend that Kelly has been whispering in my ear, um, blue is bald eagle. And it's talking about looking at year round, we both have residents and migrating birds. Absolutely. So we can identify that some of our migrating birds are the barn swallow, the purple martin, and the American robin does some weird stuff. And the robin is actually a partial migrant. So in New York, a lot of people talk about, you know, robins are the sign of spring, where that's not the case in New York. We do have robins year round, which we can see depicted in this line graph. That, however, we do have uh, some populations that are migrating over a period of time, so these are partial migrants. Yeah, so Kelly, that's a really good question. Don't all robins move south? That's not actually um, necessarily the case. Well, they've been described as our partial migrants, so some populations move south, but not all populations do. So it really depends on the region. One of the ways to specifically figure that out for your region is through bird banding. So identifying banded populations and figuring out um, what's happening. So moving forward, one trend that I really like to see is, okay, all of a sudden, let's see, January, February, March, April, May, June. In this June time period, there's both a dip in the barn swallow population as well as the American robin population. And so this is a really interesting pattern. We also see a dip later down in the year in the September time period for robins too. So we don't necessarily know what the answer is to these questions. We can start trying to figure out, tell a story. I have seen this dip before in many different areas. And Kelly, yeah, that's exactly what we think it is. It's nesting time period. The birds necessarily aren't gone. They're just less visible. They're sitting on their nest. They don't want to be seen. And so birders don't see them as often. So that's exactly what we can look at. And we can start having kids um, analyze and interpreting this type of information. What I love is the fact that bald eagles can clearly be seen. They're found year round throughout here. They're just nice, fun species to throw in. Um, so again, these are really cool features that we can start adding into um, and have kids play with. We can start, this is frequency specifically. We can look at abundance. This is fun. Ooh, that's big abundance. We can start seeing spikes, um, birds per hour. I don't know what that means exactly. Birds. birds per party hour. I just like the fact that it's called birds per party hour. Oh, party hours, the number of people who. Number, I think it's in the party. Yes, it's, it's, it's controlling for effort. Yes, so birds per party hour is the number of people in the party. Birding? No, I mean, no, it's birds per hour, but it's controlled for party size. Oh, so, so you can see that basically in September when all the purple martins are all are migrating and they're migrating huge and there's huge flocks yes. together. Whereas in wintertime, it makes sense seeing more American robins because they in the winter flocked. times they are flocked together with exactly. each other. Whereas we can guess that bald eagles are solitary birds. Um, 
barn swallows tend to be flocking to it. Yeah. And of course, this scale is probably warped because of the purple martin. It's a huge purple martin spike. Yeah. So, anyways, these are just different fun tools to play around with and have kids analyze what is the difference? What if we removed purple martin from this high bird count data and try and look at that and then see what that information is telling us? So, again, this is eBird. Uh, what I went through is the eBird under explore, and under explore, I went through bar charts. To get to the bar charts, once I selected, you know, my region, um, to get to those line graphs specifically, all I did was click on a species name. So I, here's Alabama. I can just click on the species of black belly duck, and this will give me to my um, line graph. Cool. So finally, what we want to do real quick is just share with you guys. Um, a fun bit of tidbit news in case you haven't been aware. On January, Bursluth decided to uh, create a national challenge. This is in support with the bird food companies, 3D Pet Products and Wild Delight. They are sponsoring for educators and students around the country and internationally to help the Cornell Lab better understand what birds are doing at the feeder. So our goal is to inspire kids to understand bird feeding behavior. Now, for those of you in the United States, um, what we have available are some prizes as well. All participants can receive a coupon for a free bag of bird food. Um, and what that does is we're trying to give you the tools to help study feeding birds. You um, and your kids that you work with have the opportunity to then ask any bird feeding question you want. Now, some of these questions can be, uh, here are just two sample questions that kids have sent to us. Do hummingbirds prefer feeders up high or feeders down low? How does the time of day affect black capped chickadees? Um, do uh, chickadees, how, maybe they could be characterizing feeding behaviors such as, do chickadees eat all the seeds at the feeder or do they take the feeder away? What is the visit length time of a bird visiting a feeder? The nice thing is we have all this, uh, we have sample questions and information. Let's go to the National Challenge. Right here on our website, right up in the front, the National Challenge. If you click on that, we have all the details, getting started, eligibility, but if you come down to the bottom, we have sample questions or studies that can be asked for different age groups. So a K through three, a four through eight, a ninth through 12, different sample studies, different questions um, that are perfect for you guys to get started around this. And what we would like to inspire you to do is to um, have your kids take part in the challenge, take the pledge, join the challenge. There's an online interest form that when you do that, it will allow you to download investigating evidence. That's the curriculum to support you through the inquiry process, as well as give you a coupon for a free bag bird food. Um, again, that's for those who are in the United States. For those who are outside of the United States, you are welcome to still participate. Um, we just can't send you, you know, coupons for bird food or give you any prizes. Upon participating, this is where you and the kids you work with will then actually conduct your investigation and write up a report. So these are writing up reports that are similar to what these look like. This is to be published in Birds of Investigator. So what these prizes are is that um, upon finishing your investigation, students will write up these reports, submit them to us, Birds Luth, and winners will be selected to be published in our student publication magazine. All those who were published um, and did a feeding investigation with the National Challenge will receive a um, $50 certificate that can be used for bird food, as well as Project Feeder Watch's Common Feeder Birds poster and some goodies from the Cornell Lab. We'll also select one grand prize. This is a, a special featured um, article that was really amazing went above and beyond and they'll receive a year's supply of bird food um, a free membership for project feeder watch as well as some other fun prizes 
So that's the national challenge. If you have not already signed up for it, Kelly shared the link in the chat window, I'm sure. And we recommend you guys to encourage kids to take the challenge. You can submit as a class. You can submit as individual students. Um, you can submit as homeschool families, as partners. It doesn't matter if they're formal or informal kids or after school clubs. We want to just accept any and all entries. And we will accept entries and can publish entries that are international as well. The other final thing we want to share with you guys is that if you do want to go further with supporting investigations, um, student inquiry projects at all, citizen science at all, look into the Integrating Inquiry for Educators course. Um, if you're interested in graphs, we have a whole lesson around good versus bad graphs, analyzing, interpreting information, uh, so on and so forth. It's, we've had really great feedback around this course, so I do recommend it. With that, I see it's 7 o'clock exactly. We will take any questions you guys have. And what I would just like to recommend before we have you all disperse, if you do want a certificate of completion, a letter of completion for attending this webinar, just send us an email, birdsluth at cornell.edu. Let us know you attended tonight. We'll be happy to send you a PDF of just a letter of completion for joining us. Kelly's gonna ask you to get social with her on Facebook or Twitter. Yes, please. They call it social media, but it's actually kind of lonely. So please at me on Twitter. Oh. <laughs> um, feel free to browse through our website. I'm going to stop the recording now, but the recording will be made available come Friday. And like I said, we'll take any questions you guys have.